Matthew is going to come bring us the word of God. Let's go to the Bible to John chapter 20. The Gospel of John chapter number 20. Now, before I preach anything, let me just give you a brief disclaimer. If anything I say that is different than what Pastor teaches, I'm wrong, he's right. Okay. <laughs> Let Pastor be true by every man alive. And, uh, you know, because as a guest preacher, I don't want to, you know, come across something, or your mind is. So, anyway, John chapter 20, look at verse number 30. The Gospel of John chapter 20, verse 30. The Bible says in John 20, verse 30. Now, here, the writer is giving us the purpose of the gospel in John 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly to Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believe that you might have life through his name. So the purpose of the gospel is so we might believe on his name. Now turn over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Now the purpose of the gospel is so we can believe on Christ, but there is a false doctrine that corrupts the doctrine of salvation, is the doctrine of Calvinism. Now, today I want to preach a sermon called Five Points of Calvinism Refuted. Five Points of Calvinism Refuted. Now, usually when I guess preachers don't really preach against anything, but you know, I, think, I think as a Christian, I have my duty to preach the whole counsel of God. I'm not going to shy away from anything, okay? But that was in Acts 20, look at verse number 28. Acts 20, 28. Now Paul here is instructing the elders of the church in Ephesus. Look at verse number 28 of Acts chapter 20. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves entering among you, now sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Now that would say, Paul, no, there shall be false prophets among you. It's not maybe, there shall be. Right, right. Even among ourselves. So we need to take heed. We, should, we need to uh, be grounded in the faith to fight the good fight of faith, to refute the false doctrines, okay? Now, turn the Bible to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Now, some of you might believe, you know, you may call yourself a three-point Calvinist or a one-point Calvinist. I am not really necessarily against what you believe because your definition of the five points may be different than what a Calvinist defined the five points to be. Okay? Now, it's very important to define the terms because, you know, somebody, when they ask me, are you a dispensationalist? I'll ask you what you mean by that. You know, if, if you tell me, you know, God deal with different people through the Old Testament and New Testament, I'm fine with that. But if you're preaching dispensational salvation, you're preaching another gospel. I can be the accursed. That's what the Bible says. You know, now Calvinism, as defined um, by, by by their own website, is being defined as a major branch of Protestantism that follows the theological tradition and forms of Christian practice and set down by John Calvin. And, at, and other um, Reformation era theologians and Calvinists that broke from the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. Okay, now first of all, that Baptists are not broken off the Roman Catholic Church. Right. There, there, also, right. there, there will always be a true branch following Jesus Christ. Sure. You know, we can trace the doctrine back to uh, back to the local New Testament Church. Now, the Calvinism all hinge upon what they call the five points of Calvinism, and they have the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, and each letter is a point, T, the total depravity of man, U, the unconditional election, the L, limited atonement, and L, and I, is resistible grace, and P, the perseverance of the saints, okay? Now, now first, he will come at you. If you are not, if you are not a Calvinist, you are an Armenian. You know, this is, this is stupid because, you know, well, what about people who can't afford these two? Sure, I'm making it about. You know, sure. you know, it's the same thing. I ask me, are you a Republican or am I a Democrat? I'm a Christian. You know, you, you don't have to fit into a certain system. Now, the first point is the total depravity of man. And they define that as sin has affected all parts of man. The heart, emotions, will, mind, and body are all affected by sin. We are completely sinful. We are not as simple as we could be. 
So we are completely affected by sin. And Thomas maintains that because of our fallen nature, we are born again, not by our own will, but by God's will. Now, they basically believe that man has no free will. We are unable to turn to God to be saved, and God has to give us the faith to believe on um, Jesus Christ. And they believe that Calvin meant that a lost sinner cannot come to Christ and trust him unless he's foreordained to come to Christ. Now, here's the thing. We believe in... We believe that men are the men are wicked, right? Men are depraved, but we don't believe in the total depravity. We believe men are wicked and sinners before God, but we don't believe men are incapable of coming to Christ. Now, the Bible says in John chapter 5, look at verse number uh, 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. Now, here, Jesus Christ is addressing the Jews in John chapter 5, verse 39. The Bible says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have no life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have blood. So Jesus Christ threatens the Jews, because you don't want to come to me, you will have life. Which means if you want to come to me, you will have life. Amen? Now go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Now, the colonists like to use John chapter 6, verse 44. This is the third verse. John chapter 6, verse 44. The Bible says, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, it's the third verse, right? Now, well, if you just look at look at this verse out of its context, it might prove what they are teaching. The Father has to draw them. But if you turn to John chapter 12, look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Look at verse number 32. John chapter 12, verse 32. The Bible says in John 12, verse 32, And I... If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Yeah. See, when you read the Bible in its context, it usually proves otherwise. See, all false doctrines can draw some Bible verse out of context, like baptism of the dead. Sure. If we read in context, Paul is rebuking his people. You know, so always put the Bible in context. Now, uh, go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And the other thing that Calvin's trying to cool is... They claim that faith is the gift of God. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of itself is the gift of God. You know, if, if you just study some simple grammar, then what is the gift? It's not faith. It's being saved by grace through faith. You know, it's not just simply faith. It's God-given faith. Now in John chapter 4, verse 10, uh, here we have the story of the Samaritan woman. The Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So you have to simply trust in Jesus Christ. Men are depraved, but not totally depraved. They are able to come to Christ, and throughout the gospel, we have the phrase, Thy faith has saved thee. See, it's your faith. God doesn't give you faith. Okay? It's thy faith. And say B to the Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. So the second point of the five point to it is you, the unconditional election. And by unconditional election, John Calvin meant that some are elected to, to, to go to heaven, while others are elected to hell, and that this election is unconditional. It's wholly on God's part and without condition. And by unconditional election, Calvin meant that God has already decided who will be saved and who will be lost, and the individual has absolutely nothing to do with it. He can only hope that God has elected him for heaven and not for, not for, not for hell. Now here is, uh, this actually, I pulled that from the devil's mouth. Okay. Now, they claim there's no condition. God foreordained who go to heaven and who will go to hell. But let me tell you, there is a condition. Romans 10, verse number 9. Romans 10, verse 9. And that if, what is that? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. They claim there's no condition. There is one. If thou. That's you. And that's your choice. Okay? Put in Romans chapter 9. Just one chapter earlier. Romans chapter 9. Now, Romans chapter 9 is a passage that Calvinists always use to prove the predestination, the foreordained part, okay? Now, Romans chapter 9, verse number 10, 
here is when God promised Isaac and Rebekah his son. Look at verse number 10 of Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, verse number 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Notice that for the children being not yet born, they are not born, right? Never having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not the works, but the pain that called them. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob had a love, but Esau had a hated. Now, the Catholics want to say, See, the children was not born yet. God already know the elder shall serve the younger, and Jacob I love, he is not hated. Okay? Now, first, they are pulling it out, of, pulling it completely out of its context, but the second, where in this verse says, who go to hell, who go to heaven. Right? Even if they are in context, it has nothing to do with heaven or hell. Okay? Now, let me just tell you what that verse actually meant. Now, verse 12 and verse 13 are the Old Testament quotes. Okay. Now, it is always wise when the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, it's always wise to go back and read in context. Okay? Now, verse number 12, I also Genesis 25. Verse 12, the elder shall serve the younger is a quote from Genesis 25. So the question is, when God says, Jacob I love, Esau and I hate it, what did God mean by that? Okay? Now, Genesis chapter 25, look at verse number 22. Genesis 25, verse 22. Genesis 25, verse 22. The Bible says, and the children struggle together with her. Talking about Rebecca, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two what? Nations are in thy womb, and two manner of what? People shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall be young. See, if you put that verse in context, what is God addressing? Is it literally because of being Jacob and Esau? No, it's the nation of Israel and Eden. And throughout the Bible, you, you, can, you will never see, uh, see actually Esau serving Jacob, but you can see the nation, right? Serving each other, okay? Now go to Malachi chapter 1. The last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1. So, God hates the nation of Edom, and also I believe Isaac is a picture of saved, saved believers, and Esau is a picture of the unsaved. It's, it's the illustration versus doctrine, okay? God chose Jacob to be the holy nation of Israel before he was born. That's what that verse meant. Nothing talking about spiritual salvation or condemnation. Okay. Now, verse 13 is also a quote from Malachi chapter 1, look at verse number 2. Malachi 1, verse number 2. The Bible says, I have loved you, says the Lord, if ye say, wherein had thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. And lay his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Look at verse number four. Whereas what? Eda said, We are impoverished, <laughs> and we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw them down, and they shall call them the borders of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord had indignation fled. See, if you actually look at the Old Testament quotes, it's never talking about the individual of Jacob and Esau, but the nation. Make sense? Eden of Israel. God ordained Jacob to be the holy nation of Israel before he was born. Nothing about spiritual salvation. Okay? Now go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, you might ask, what about predestination? They think, you know, people are predestined to heaven and hell. Now, first, just think about it logically. There's a guy who chooses. You go to hell, you go to heaven. That's not a God of the Bible. They're serving an unknown God. You know, that's not a God of the Bible, and they're preaching a false gospel if, if, if that's what they believe. Now, if you put the predestination in context, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did or no, he also did predestine it to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first one among many brethren. Now first, where does it say God chose who go to heaven and who go to hell? What, what, what is predestination? What does it mean? Be conformed to the image of the Son, right? Which means everyone we say are adopted 
to the family of God, right? Right? So you move the image of the Son. It, it is the same thing as a. Uh, you, you can go to your Jeremiah chapter, chapter 19. Jeremiah um, 19. Uh, let me read from you Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. The whole thing about predestination is we have to be, be in Christ, and we are adopted of the children by Jesus Christ to himself. Nothing about spiritual salvation. Okay? Now, just because God knows who is, who is going to be saved, does not mean we don't have free will. Okay? Yeah. That's what Bible says, choose life. You yeah. want life or death. Okay? Yeah. Now, the thing about Calvinism is so wicked is they, they think everything is, is the will of God. You know, rape is the will of God, child molestation is the will of God, and they also claim all babies go to hell. Hello? And in the Bible, they don't have the knowledge of sin yet. You know, we have the scripture. Uh, all these evidence prove babies go to him when he dies. Okay. Right. Now, Jeremiah chapter 19, look at verse 25. Jeremiah 19, verse 5. Now, here is God speaking to the children of Israel in Jeremiah 19, verse 5. The Bible says, They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came into my mind. See, these wicked things like abortion, everybody knows songs, amen. These, God didn't even think about it. It's man's wickedness, amen. See, the comments that, you know, these things are the will of God, rape, pillage, thunder. No, God didn't even thought about that. Right. It's our own wickedness, amen. For the first Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. So as I talk about the total depravity of man, the unconditional election, but now the third point in two letters is the letter L. And they call it limited atonement. Limited atonement. Now, to me, this is the most blasphemous point out of all five points. It is. And they, because they believe that Christ only died for the elect, for those who planned and ordained to go to heaven, and he did not die for those who planned and ordained to go to hell. Now, first thing we have to do. Now, here is the point. All other points, they have some verses out of context. But this point, they have nothing. First Timothy chapter two, look at verse number three. First Timothy two, verse three. The Bible says, "For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto knowledge of the truth." And they try to say, "Oh, it's not really me." Oh, and they, they go back to Greek without even speaking Greek. Yeah, yeah. And then go ahead and it's right. Go to chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. The thing is, yes, if the King James is I think we translate it. If you go back to Greek, it should say the same thing. Right? First Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 10. First Timothy 4, verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, don't miss this, especially of those that believe. Which means he's also the Savior of those that don't believe. Amen? Now, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let, 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 let me read to you uh, Hebrew chapter 2, verse, verse 9. Hebrew 2, verse 9. So we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, the suffering of death, covered, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Amen. Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 1. 2 Peter 2, verse number 1. For there were false prophets also, also among, the, among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privilege shall bring to them for heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves with destruction. Now the concept of second fish other two is talking about these false prophets, you know, they are they are they are, they are going to help it. And the Bible says, even denying the Lord that bought them. Now what, 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 what does that mean? He even died for these people who are going to help. Right? You know? And, and of course, um, in First John chapter two, the Bible says uh, he is the he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, right. but also for the sins of the whole world. Right. Not only for the saved, but also for the unsaved. And to believe Jesus does not die for anyone, that's a general heresy. Okay. Now go to uh, Acts chapter seven. It's the letter I, and they call it the irresistible grace. 
And by, and, and by that, John Calvin meant that God simply forces people to be saved. God elected some to be saved, and he, like Jesus Christ, died for that elect group. And now by it, resistible grace, he forces those he elect, and those Jesus Christ died for to be saved. Basically, believe if thou wants to be saved, you can be denied. You will be saved. Now, here's the problem. Um, and in Acts chapter 7, we have Stephen addressing the unbelieving Jews in Acts chapter 7. Look at verse number 51. Acts 7, verse 51, Bible says, Acts 7, verse 51, Bible says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always, what? Resist the Holy Ghost at the Father's day, so believe. I wonder if Thomas they can read the Bible. I mean, it's, a, it's the exact opposite of what they believe, you know. You wonder whether the, Spirit, whether the Holy Spirit is in them or not. And the thing is, we should be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what God's plan for us, but it is possible. And they do have a choice. You know, God is not capable of letting people to hell. Right. You know, that, that's not a kind of Bible. They might mean Buddha or you know, God of Star Wars. I don't know. But, <laughs> well, we got the God of Force, right? The God of Force. Yeah, you make it. So I didn't reach you. Now let's go back to the service. <laughs> we don't want to lie. Go, go, go to your next um, 24. Now, the last point. I thought I'd say the last point. I have to finish my career, I think. <laughs> Last point of two letters, the letter P is called the perseverance of the saints. Now this point is always mistaken as the preservation of the saints. And we believe in the preservation. One saved, always saved, right? Mm -hmm. The great the believers, but what they believe is different. You know, they believe if you backslide or you need to sin, you can stop sinning, you're not really saved. You know, they assume you have to present in the end. And, and their first verse again is out, again, out of context and imagine Matthew 24, look at verse number 13. Matthew 24, verse 13. Here's a version in the famous Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, verse 13. The he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. See, you have to endure to the end to be saved. Uh, <laughs> if you read further in verse 22, I'm going to say in verse 22 in context, Matthew 24, verse 22, about that, and except those days should be shortened, there should no what flesh say. When the elect say those days should be short. So when the Bible talks about being saved, it's not always being saved for salvation. Like you were saved by fire, saved by drowning, right? Same thing. If somebody asks me, do you believe in baptism? What do you mean by that? Baptized by fire, water, immersion, sprinkling, they find the truth, right? See, always read the Bible in context, and you don't have to endure to the end to be saved. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of people who think, you know, if someone don't go to church, they might be saved. But here's the problem. There are a lot of parts in the New Testament are addressing to the Christians which you stop sinning, right? And it is God's will for us to stop sinning. But the problem is, if you live after the flesh, you will, you will do the works of the flesh. If you live after the Spirit, you will do this, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, and let me just say this, um, if you don't believe me, it's fine. I believe a person can be saved without any external works. Because, the, because I believe there must be a big change. Someone's going to hell and now they're going to heaven, but they might not have the external works displayed. And it's very dangerous to judge people by their works. You know, of course, you know, by words, our faith make perfect, and it's more profitable, but it's very dangerous. You know, just because our faith make perfect, and it's more profitable, but it's very dangerous. You know, just because we weak, that has nothing to do with people who bless over much. And that's very dangerous. And that doctrine, the perseverance of the saints, has creeping into the Baptist church. They didn't have to stop sinning, have a total salvation. Romans 4 is very Romans 4 is so clear, but to him that worketh not, to believe it on him that justified the ungodly faith is counted to righteousness. Yeah. To the Hebrew chapter 12. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. See, some preachers want to talk about, you know, if, if they don't quit smoking pot, and how do I say it, 
but but that preachers, but that preacher still have the donut addiction, okay? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah. You know, but you're hitting all the time. I'm hitting by, by the same standards, okay? <laughs> See, you always judge themselves by, by your self standard. And the Bible, the thing is, if you are saved without works, why do you need to keep your salvation by your works? Right. Doesn't make any sense, sense okay? Right, in Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse number 6. Hebrews 12, verse 6, the Bible says, Hebrews 12, verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, notice that, every son whom he receiveth. Which means God chastised every Christian, right? right? Which means every person has sinned. Make sense? Right. And you know, by, 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 by what they believe, they're not really saved. Faith is not really saved, Paul is not really saved. We are all lost. And then just claim everybody as a reprobate. You know, go ahead. If, if what you're going to play that game, you, know, you, you are still sinners. And if you deny you're a sinner, I don't think you're going to say You know, it's going to mean you're even lost. That's the point. And in Hebrew 12, look at verse 8. But if you be without chastise, then we're. All are partakers, then are you bastards and not saved. And also, if, if you don't receive chastisement, you might not be able to say it. Because the loving Father will chase them every single son. Because every Christian is a You know, in Romans 6, it's very clear. You know, what, 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 what do we say then? Shall we continue to sing that grace God may abound? Yeah. God forbid. Yeah. Which means if we sing grace will abound, but shall we? God forbid. See? So it's very dangerous to judge someone by their works because their salvation is not of works. Why are we judging people's salvation by their works? I'm not saying you can never do that, but be very careful. Sure. You know, John chapter 10. I have 10 more minutes. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Now, the Bible does teach about the preservation of the sin. The preservation of the sin. Now, Calvinists who believe if you backslide, you can never be saved, and, 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 and if you tell them one thing, always say they'll mock it. You know? And, and they'll, they'll say some, something like, you know, God will preserve you, right? God will preserve you, but you can stop believing. You know, God is holding your hand, but you can let go. But here's the problem. In John chapter 10, look at verse number um, 28. John chapter 10, verse 28, it all says, John 10, verse 28. Amen. And, and I, Jesus, gave unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Right. Now, I need someone uh, for a brief illustration. Come. Oh, yeah. See, wow. the thing is, they, they think, you know, you can stop believing and let go. Here's the thing. If you are saved, God is holding your hand, right? Mm -hmm. Now, walk away. Walk away. Walk away. Come on. Oh, now, God. Here's the point. Oh, God. The, God. They think you can stop believing. You can walk away. And look, look, look what the Bible says in verse 29. The Bible says, No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. No man, including yourself. Right. Are you a man or woman? See, they think you can walk away. You can. If you think you can walk away from God, which means you are stronger than God, that makes you a heretic. Amen. Amen. And, and the whole thing is so totally ridiculous. And being preserved until the day of redemption is not based on us. It's based on God's promise. It's based on the faithful God. It's based on God that cannot lie. In John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we are to contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You know, it's just simply defending the common salvation. John chapter 3, verse 18. And if Phil Bill will stop telling you, you know, that you're stop believing, and, 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 and you, you heard the story, you know, people who grew up in a Christian family and they become an atheist. They're not, they're not saving the first place. You can't stop believing. But even if you can, salvation is still everlasting. Apparently. Either way, John chapter 3, look at verse 18. There are only two types of people living on this earth. John chapter 3, verse 18. He that believeth on him. It's not condemned, but he that believes is not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There are only two types of people those who believe and those who have not believed. There's no such negative of stop believing. 
you know, the thing is, if you are saved, you can hear the voice of the shepherd. You know, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling with you. How can you stop believing? You know, and the only uh, reason that you're not saved is perfect. Now, um, okay, first Corinthians chapter 13, first Corinthians 13. Let me just close this sermon uh, with a brief application of that. So we talked talk about the first point, the total depravity of man. We don't believe in total depravity. Man had a choice. In fact, it's a total dependence of man on God. And then we need to depend on God for salvation. And the second point, the unconditional election, but that, that's false. There is a condition. You have to personally believe unto the Christ. And point number three, living in atonement is not scriptural. If you die for all men, especially for those that believe, and point number four, the irresistible grace, there, there is a way to resist the Holy Spirit, to resist gospel, and as Christians, you know, we ought to uh, we ought to uh, be conformed to the image of God, to have a soft heart, to conform to God's will. And the last point, the, the, the perseverance of the saints, you know, we believe in the preservation of saints. You know, if you commit murder, you know, even adultery, God has God has a cover. There's a faithful God. And and to me, the worst thing about Calvinism is if they believe in if they truly believe in that, there's no soul. There's no outrage. Right. And, and, and and the thing I hate about Calvinism the most is they seem to have an answer of everything, right? They seem to love all these debates, you know, they seem to have all these arguments, they seem to they love their acts of Jesus. Well, which I'm not against that, you know. The thing is, they seem to know everything about God and May God, uh, the Babylon, Ezekiel's temple. They seem to have every theological answer, but they forget, they, but they forsake about the first one. They forget about the first one. Right? They don't even care about the law. Notice the, the most the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. They have answered every theological question, but if they are not actively doing the great mission, the mission to the church, they have nothing. You know, they can argue, you know, even Baptists, they can, you know, even a lot of Baptists, they sit behind the libraries, they yeah. read the books, they don't do anything. You know, and, and let me stop here before I go too far. But, you know, we as bible Christians ought to take heed. You know, we ought to have charity. It's, it's great to know the whole counsel of God. It's great to heard the Bible that ought to be preached. You know, you have a great church. You know, every sermon is a, a state dinner. I love it. You know, I love learning new stuff. I'm learning. I love learning. Um, refreshing you know, all, all these deep doctrines, all these dark sayings. But we should do the first one. The go so many. Because there is a condition. They have to believe. In order for them to believe, you have to tell them about Jesus. Final minute. Go to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Now, people will say, so many doesn't work. You know, because it doesn't bring people to church, nobody gets saved. But, but here's my problem. Here's the idea why it's so dangerous for the common belief to creep in into our churches. No so many. Focus on arguments, debates, they want people to rather debate, go to hell. Yeah. You know, let me, let me just go on, on that. And the thing is, they claim so many doesn't work. You know, why preach the gospel? Okay. But the Bible in Psalm 126, look at verse number 6. Psalm 126, verse number 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, what's the next word? Yeah. Shall doubtless come again with, with rejoicing and bring the seeds with him. Someone doesn't work, it's always working. If you, if you do the work. You know, here's the thing. If someone doesn't work, the Bible has not lost its power. If someone doesn't work, God, God is lying. If someone doesn't work, you don't have to choose your life. The Bible is so clear. It says, upon this, you shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bring his sheep with him. And, and, and so many so many might not always be a great tool for bringing to the church, but a great tool of giving the gospel. So, if you do the word that, what the God will do in people's lives? See, 
Last summer, I worked in the public camp with hundreds of kids. And, 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 and some of them, they, they, they say, that they might not be in church meeting one time. But I think that was their salvation because they're verbal testimony, because they believe in their heart. And there's a condition. So go out and, and, don't, and, 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 and don't just sit in the pure and sit, sing, and be sour. Yeah. Yeah. As they yeah. do some soul winning, because there's a condition, and, and, and we have the great commission, and we have a total dependence on God, and we ought to contend for the faith. You know, you know, preach against all the false doctrines, but don't forget, it, it's okay, it's okay to, it's okay to dig deep. You know, we are supposed to dig into the hidden manna, as, mm -hmm. as John said in the book of Revelation. But don't forget about the first one. Don't forget about the great commission. There's a condition, in order for them to be saved, you have to tell them. That's great. Dear Lord, thanks so much for this time to preach your word. And Lord, I pray that you gave us a compassion for to bring the gospel to the lost, and, and to be always mindful of, of the common salvation, and to be for the faith, by the view, by the faith. Help us have your sight and your eyes on the human being. I pray that you hear us Amen. 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 You know, we just in the week actually set the clock back about you know, you know, okay, so. okay. Everybody else is going to be watching over here. Hey, it passed 3 o'clock. Yeah. No, it's not. It's right there. Keep that on. Yeah. Amen. Uh, appreciate the content. And, uh, and I, I like the quickness of the presentation. My dad used to do this when I was free. She still does this. We were in the room and we were the same thing. If I were free, she would be something like this. If I start to wax off, my feet start doing this. That's the book. So here it goes. What's the book say? Here's the Bible. Where's the Bible on that? I need to that all through. That's it's important. You know, you're like, man, I just closed my Bible. I got to turn it again? I just closed it. I got to turn it again? No, that's good. Yeah, that's good. In the book, every point based on the word of God. Amen. So appreciate that. Um, I am not five point seven, but I'm not three point seven, two point seven, one point. I disagree with all five points. All right. Well, it's been a good day. Yeah. 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 Y'all enjoyed that? Man, yeah. for a few more days, so keep going. Thank you.